I am so excited to be with you all tonight. So this this song is uh, has been one of our intro songs for these events because it's from a kid's cartoon and it talks about a unicorn shooting marshmallow lasers and spreading rainbows all around the world. So uh, pretty awesome way to get started. I have everybody on mute um, uh, because one of the unique things about Zoom is that if there is a loud noise in your background, if you happen to have two kids like I do or dogs running around that bark, uh, your face would show up in the middle of the screen and we wouldn't get to hear about all the amazing cheese stuff. Um, so I am absolutely thrilled to be a part of this experience. Let me go ahead. I'm going to really get things rolling here in a hot second. There's two ways you can view tonight uh, in your top right corner of your screen. You should have a button that gives you the option for uh, speaker view or gallery view. Um, gallery view is if you want to see everybody's smiling faces. Uh, speaker view will be a, probably a better experience to see the videos and to uh, see the cheese makers in all their glory. Uh, I am so thrilled to be with you. I'm John Antonelli. Uh, my wife, Kendall, is uh, in the back room uh, manning the children, making sure that they are uh, quiet, unlike uh, one of the events we recorded last week when they decided not to be. And that's how it works, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, and I am just grateful to be with y'all. And um, as part of my cheese geekery, uh, these journeys uh, that we get to go uh, virtually behind the scenes with some of my cheese heroes is outstanding and spectacular. And so um, I am not going to take much more of your time. I just set the expectations and then we get to listen from the masters. Um, we will be going through this tasting over the next hour, 20 minutes or so. Definitely use the chat feature. Uh, there's a group chat box at the bottom of your screen. Type in questions there. Um, uh, tell me what you're, if you're celebrating something tonight, uh, tell us what you're drinking uh, to go uh, with these cheeses that we're tasting. Um, I will put into the uh, window tonight, Susan, all the pairings. I'll be typing them in as we go. I ended up spending, uh, getting to spend quite a lot of time with Kendall and the kids today. And then we ended up with, uh, I, I we're hosting a, a fundraiser for the Thinkery in a couple of weeks and we had some practice rounds we had to do. So I didn't get to type them yet, but I will as we go. Um, so during the course of this tasting, we're just gonna be having fun, listening to Stuart, listening to Rachel, um, these guys, they, they, this is an amazing family and we'll be eating this delicious cheese. So here is what the plate looks like. Um, my, uh, there are, uh, two pieces of cheese with chocolate, one that's a darker chocolate, one that's a lighter. We're going to be starting with the cheese that is got the cho uh, darker chocolate on top. That's going to be, it's in my one o'clock position on my plate. And then we'll be going around clockwise and doing the pairings. Um, we did plate out of order tonight um, because our sheep milk uh, experience will be coming towards the tail end tonight. Um, and so the cheese that's in the second position, we're actually gonna be tasting uh, towards the end. So I've just mentioned that now so we can skip it. Um, but honestly, I don't wanna take any more of the time. I wanna introduce uh, Stuart Veldheisen. He is an amazing cheese maker, uh, an inspiration. Let me make sure I can spotlight his video. There he is. Welcome. Thank you hey, for being here. Um, we are absolutely thrilled. This is such a cool uh, moment for us getting to come into your, uh, into the, your home, into your, onto your farm, uh, into the facility, and getting to share this with uh, our, our customers and our friends uh, and our team members. I know some of our team members are on too tonight. And so um, thank you for all that you do for the industry and for what you've done for the Texas cheesemakers. Um, and you're just awesome. And I'm so glad to get to spend the night with you. And so welcome to the party. And uh, yeah, and as people are telling us what they're drinking, I'm gonna tell them what to pair it with along the way, but we're gonna go cheese by cheese. And Stuart, I throw it to you. Thank you for being here. Right. Well, thank you. Great being here. Thanks, John, for doing this and all the work you do in Austin and, and around Texas. And, you know, sometimes I meet you in Italy though. Remember? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We can't find each other in Texas, but we meet in Italy. In the, in the smallest little town in Italy. Yeah. Bra. Yeah. There we are. Amazing, it's, huh? Bra, bra is the largest cheese festival in the world. 
Oh, it was amazing. And if you haven't gotten a chance to go, I guess you and I are likely the only two. It is. <laughs> I'm it is ready awesome. to go again. I know that. And I, I go for the people, I guess now. Not yeah, the that was great. That was awesome. Well, hey, welcome everybody. So I'm standing in our cheese shop, and some of you have maybe been here, and some not. But if you haven't, you're always welcome to visit the farm. So, anyways, I've been making cheese for 18 years. And um, I'll tell you about some experiences along the way. But uh, used to be a dairyman that sold milk on the open market. And we got out of dairying in the late 90s and said, I'm never going to milk another cow again. And uh, life took some turns. And here we are again. I just love agriculture uh, from a little boy. And um, the cheese business has brought me to a place that I have now really enjoyed agriculture because we get to do the, the full gamut from start to finish. And I really found that being creativity was a part of me that I wasn't really able to do in a, in a much uh, in depth way with commercial ag where with cheese making and being creative and now, you know, in this type of work, it's, brought me to a whole new level and and has brought me to a lot of places uh, in the world that I got to see because of cheese. So I would have never known that unless I got into the cheese business. So on one of the first subjects was um, how I taste cheese. So I am gonna open a wheel of cheese tonight, but it's not one that you folks have. So in order for you to try it, you're gonna have to come to the shop or John is gonna have to get some on his next order. Now, this is a Greens Creek that we have not had for a while because we were kind of short on milk for a little while and so we weren't able to make it. But, so we got a wheel that I literally pulled from the cave 10 minutes ago. And this is my favorite way. Now, I know not near many, you know, not many people get to experience this, but if you are at the farm, and I'm opening a new wheel. I do share this with people because it is such a beautiful experience. So this is a Greens Creek. And what I do when I open this up, I feel the texture with the knife going through the cheese. And that tells me if my texture is nice. So I can tell with the first cut already what the texture is gonna be like. If I got a good feel, that's a great sign. And then I do a smell, okay? So it feels really nice. And I love doing the right from the cave because it's um, the temperature of the cave. And it's like the cheese is really magical when it comes directly from the cave. So, oh yeah. Mm. So I love that smell, mm, beautiful. Look at this, you guys. I got a little Swiss action going on in here. Can you got a good shot of that, John? That looks awesome, wow, yes. I knew that this Greens Creek normally doesn't have quite this much uh, Swiss action going on in there, but we have really green grass in April when this was produced. And green of the grass, you know, yellow are the cheese, but also there's propionic acid that goes on and that produces a gas. Now I actually put a little bit of an inhibitor in there because if, it, if I get too much going on, this wheel will literally crack. This is perfect. So I'm gonna, this is really fun, you guys. I wish you could have had this. Yeah, I wish I had one of those big knives in my house. Yeah, awesome. this is beautiful. Mm. Mm. This is making, making everybody everybody's mouth water. This I'm is it. You will all get to taste <laughs> cheese, I promise. You gotta put this on your next order. Awesome. Okay, that is fabulous. There you go, Chelsea, try that one. Beautiful, that's how I taste cheese. With lots of yums. That's awesome. Lots of yums. Mm. Awesome. It Look is good. so perfect when it's room temperature. So when you do cheese tasting, let your cheese warm up. Let it get a little warmer. It really, the flavors just really come alive. 
and you get different flavors too. With it's too cold, it's just, it kind of um, hides a lot of the flavors. You let that warm up, it's really alive. That's beautiful, isn't it, Chelsea? Really beautiful. Yeah. Greens Creek is a favorite of ours. That's awesome. Yeah, you're going to love it. It doesn't always get that type of um, holes in it, but when it does, it's still fun. It makes it, Here's the thing. With raw milk, I'll explain that a little bit too. With raw milk cheese, we don't standardize our milk. So therefore, there's going to be cultures and so that naturally will occur in the milk different times of the year that will change it a little bit. So it won't always be the same. It will vary a little bit. If we pasteurized and standardized our milk first, I could get it to come out exactly the same every time. But with raw milk, we're gonna get some variances and it can make it fun, I think. So here's our uh, Texas star. So let's move on to that so that you guys get to join in with me now. <laughs> Customer, a customer was asking uh, to describe the flavors, and so I was imagining it to have sort of like a eggy, oniony, uh, and that that gassy flavor that the there, style cheeses. Yeah. Come from. There is some gassy flavor in there, like a little bit of Swiss, like a Yarborough type cheese. And that's a good thing in this kind of cheese, y'all. That's what's you. Good thing, absolutely. Yep. It is a good thing. A lot of nuttiness to it too. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's it's wonderful. Those those little air pockets are a hold in gas, and that then permeates into the fat flavors and stuff. And so it's that's what you'd expect. You know, uh, intense Swiss cheese has a lot of those big holes, and the Greens Creek has fewer. So it's there, but it's not the only flavor you're gonna get. Correct. The nuttiness. So the, and the, good stuff. the reason for the eyes, it's actually gas formation that the gas produces and blows up and that's that's why you know you get the nice beautiful eyes it isn't that we packed it that way and somehow it happens that's all created by gas so it's pretty fun we'll all get to try it soon you will you're gonna get some because i got a nice batch of it it's awesome. beautiful piece okay texas star Texas Star. So I just I just typed in all of the pairings into the chat box, y'all, for the night. And uh, as you can see, uh, the fat tail tome, which is on your plate in the second position, is going to get skipped and become the fifth cheese that we taste tonight. So Texas Star, let's take it away. I'm in, I'm hungry. So what do you think? Texas Star. This is one of my own creations of cheese. It is a natural rind cheese. So you can see here the natural rind on the edge. We, we create that by washing it for about well, three to four weeks. It's usually closer to four weeks. And we wash that with a brine solution. So the brine is made up of whey saturated with salt and we literally will rub this or i can use this wheel but we'll literally rub the cheese with a rag and make a smear on it and it'll create this it'll dry it a little bit on the edges and create this beautiful rind but it really leaves in the flavors of the cave and it ages with more oxygen and all of that changes the flavor of the cheese so this is a great melting cheese also, the style, because it's not a cheddar. So cheddars, usually the fats will separate a little bit, but not on a Texas star. So it's beautiful when it comes to melting, but it is just great with eating and pairing. What are you pairing this with tonight? This cheese tastes great tonight. I love it. It's got a, beautiful. Um, a nice little acidity to it tonight, which is great. Yeah. Um, and tell us what you're tasting on your end. Um, but our wheels, you know, I've had it out for an hour. Good, pliable, uh, good texture to it. Mm -hmm. um, this one 
has is a, a nice, uh, you know, the mouth feels spectacular. Once you bite into it, it sort of turns into cream. Um, right. But it's tasty. And there's a lot of creaminess, butteriness to it. Um, still getting a little, a little grassiness. So one of the customers, Stuart, asked which cheese is first. So uh, it had this on top of it. Let me, I'll spotlight my video. This is a Texas Pecan Brittle Bar. If you'll know, it's a chocolate bar. If you note, there were two chocolates on cheese tonight. Uh, there was a lighter one and then the darker one. And we're eating it with the darker of the two chocolates. Um, so that will be, it should be in one o'clock to the right of the uh, corn nuts. That should be where it lives. All right, back to you, Stuart. Um, All right, so, and you'll notice when you sell this, do you sell it like a piece like this? Yes, exactly. Okay. So it will, it might be a little saltier on the one end versus the inside, just because we brine wash that. So the flavors do change just a little bit from inside, you know, to out on the cheese. But I really like this one just because there is a lot of natural flavors going on when I say like natural flavors of, of, a, of a grassiness from the, and the real dairiness of the butter, buttery, creaminess that's going on. And um, let's see, this one is aged about, when is this one here? January. Oh, this is pretty old. No, October. This is October of 19. I bet you you're about on the same one, right? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. And it's tasting great. Oh, yeah, it tastes great. This is really a nice mature cheese. It's ready to be consumed. And uh, I wouldn't like it to go too much longer for aging. Sometimes they do, but this is really perfect right now because it's got a nice acidity to it. It's beautiful. Well, it's great. And I'm going to play, I know we have video of the cows and often everything starts with the cow's milk, yeah. right? Maybe the animals themselves and the land. I know you guys care so much about that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And then, yeah. and it's a, a five minute video series. So if you want to kind of talk through some of these things that we're seeing um, and uh, share some stories, I know you always have good stories to share, but you should be able to see my screen now. Okay, so these pictures were just taken just a few days ago. So it's pretty hot out. So in the afternoon, the cows, we have natural shade for them. They're just out in the trees. And, um, but they're grazing also. And, uh, And then what we also do uh, is we keep waters, fresh waters out in the field. So wherever they are, they're really not too far from fresh water. But um, these girls there, they get milked at 4.30 in the morning and about four o'clock in the afternoon. And we have a variety of breeds, a lot of Jersey and Guernsey crosses, but we have a little other stuff in there too. There's a there's a few, you know, a little bit of Holstein blood left in there, but not much. And there might be a little brown Swiss and things like that. But you can see the grass is really good right now. And that was just taken a few days ago. So yeah, this we like to keep a lot of um, I'll let a lot of natural grasses grow, but I also intercede some other grass, like we'll put um, brown top millet in. It's kind of an open pollinated grass, they call it a millet, but it will let it go to seed and a lot of it will come back the following year. Of course, it all depends on the weather. We get so many variables in Texas. But, um, and then in the winter times, I'll plant uh, oats and like a winter Austrian pea, they call them a winter, yeah, winter pea. And um, we'll let them graze on that. And the pea puts in nitrogen into the soil. So I try to keep stuff as natural as we possibly can and um, keep them out on the grass. So. 
with interseeding some different feeds into the already grass, we can keep a longer growing season going. So the cows are being brought up for milking there. How many cows do you have in the herd? Um, we keep around 50 milking most of the time. And then there'll be a few dry cows also. And so I think we have about 60 cows right now. Yeah, and then we grow our own heifers and stuff too. They're beautiful. What, what, what part of the property are we on right now seeing? Now, you are just south of kind of the dairy barn. You can see some of the buildings in the site like, let's see, not right there. Well, I'll let you know when we get a little more to it. So they, they're on a field of about 28 acres right now. That's beautiful. And we didn't yeah. say exactly where in Texas you, you are located. Um, we are southwest of Fort Worth, about 65 miles. So Stephenville, we're just a few miles from Stephenville, but Fort Worth's 65 miles southwest. So here we are in the milking parlor. So we milk seven cows on each side at a time. So milking takes very little time, just a little over an hour, and the cows are back out to the field. So they're on the concrete for just really very, very little time. The longest that any of them are on the concrete is about an hour. So you can see him putting milkers on there. So he already, you know, cleaned the cow's teats. And we'll just use a peroxide base cleaner and then uh, wipe them. And then he puts the milkers on. So all of this goes into pipelines it's never, you know, bucketed or hand milked. And it's never really exposed to the open air. So it just keeps it a lot cleaner. And then uh, it's chilled in a tank until the cheese making day. That's amazing. So you could fit about what, 10, 10 to 12? How many are on there? Well, there's seven milkers on each side. So there's 14 cows milking at a time. Okay. All right. That's awesome. And we clearly have a lot more video to go through. Yeah. Good. Cheese to eat tonight. So um, as people, as you are watching these videos, y'all, if you have any questions along the way for Stuart, just, uh, yeah, use the, uh, the chat window. Jessica just asked, how long does milking take? And uh, David had asked if it was manual or automated. I think um, yeah. automated. Um, All automated. But there's still a lot of hands involved, right? Oh yeah, because you you still have to clean by hand and put the milkers on. You know that we don't. It's not robotic to the effect of putting the milkers on. That is out there today, but we we don't have that. Yeah. Uh, so then, the milking, the milker will only be on a cow for maybe five or six minutes, and then she's milked. And uh, so by the time they walk in the barn, you know, you prep them, put the milker on, get them all done. They're they're only in the barn maybe fifteen minutes, so it doesn't take really very long at all. Um, and then so. And asks, how often do you start make uh, start cheeses? So I guess how often do you make cheeses in a week? And then uh, our beer drinking fools ask, uh, do they get treats while they're in the parlor? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we don't give them treats in the parlor. We used to, but we found that it's a lot cleaner if we don't put treats in the parlor and we have way less flies and uh, so we found that we just feed them a little bit of grain after milking, but nothing in the parlor. And um, let's see, what was the other question you said? Is how often do you make cheese in a week? Cheese making. So right now we're doing just twice a week with cow cheese making and twice a week with sheep cheese making. 
And some of that has to do with the amount of production, but also the size of that. Now, a year and a half ago, I was making cheese eight times in a week. We literally made cheese every day except Sunday. But on Tuesday and Fridays, I think it was, or yeah. I think Tuesday and Fridays, we were doing double batches because we just had a small vat of 300 gallons and we were milking a lot of cows, a little more than we are now. And um, so we were making cheese literally every day except Sunday. Wow. And uh, amazing. That was really, really busy. Then we upgraded, I got a bigger vat. And the reason I did that is even though I love the milk that's really, really fresh, um, you know, when you can make, like when I was making every day, I'd put cold milk in the vat, you know, in the morning that was milk the previous night. But then that morning's milk, I put directly into the vat. I never cooled it. It does make amazing cheese. It's crazy how those little things, you know, really make a significant difference. I can taste it. But the problem is I was working my help too much. And I thought, if I want to keep my help around, I got to tone this back a little bit. So we decided to get a bigger vat so we aren't making cheese every day of the week. And we didn't have to make it on Thanksgiving or Christmas for the yeah. first time. <laughs> Chelsea's, Chelsea's piping in. She says this is the first time we didn't have to make cheese on Thanksgiving and Christmas Day and New Year's. So. And that literally is so. I've made cheese many a times on Christmas morning. That's awesome. That, well, that's awesome that you're committed. Awesome that you get the time off. Um, yeah. Did you notice uh, this? Uh, me, I told you I'm the biggest. I'm like the biggest cheese geek in the world. Did you yeah. notice? Um, uh, did you had to change your recipes at all when you increase the volume of the t uh, size of the vat, just in the from a timing perspective or anything like that? No, really proportions, it's just, everything works the same. You just need to add a little more culture and a little more rennet. And, um, but it actually, there was some adjustments because it's a little different type of a vat. But um, it really, the adjustment went, went pretty good. Within maybe five times of making cheese in there, I was like, okay, I'm getting this down pretty good already. So it, it went good. So everything's kind of relative with cheese making as far as proportions and temperatures and stuff like that. It's just that every vat will work a little different. So you, the cheese maker has to learn temperature adjustments and stuff. Awesome. I, I have a question here before we dive into the next uh, area, which is cheese making. Great uh, opportunity. Uh, what, what do they call that? Uh, segue in, uh, but yeah. if you were to give a cow a treat, if you were allowed, what would that treat be? <laughs> Other beer drinkers are asking that question. Oh my goodness. They might be picturing like a brownie or a donut. I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. Um, you know, they, uh, they love, I'll tell you from experience in the past, what they really love is extruded soybeans. And it's soybeans, but they go through what they call an extruder and the pressure creates a little heat. And so they almost come out liquidy. And then when it cools, it's this nice crumbled meal that really does smell amazing. Oh, and, so yeah, it really is phenomenal. And cows just love it. But it's hard to find. I got I we used it when we were in the Midwest, but I've never been able to find it here in the South. Right. Well, now Patrick has his answer. Next, yeah, he's got his, he's got his answer. Excuse yeah. When he comes up to the farm, they go nuts over it. Nuts. And when he comes up to the farm for a tour soon, he'll probably bring some in his pocket as a nice little. All right. <laughs> Our next cheese, y'all, we're going to skip the one that's plated in the second position. We're going to go to the third one that has this really uh, nice orange rind to it. Let me, oh, you've got it right there. You've got the, yeah. uh, Stuart, if you want to talk about Dublin, that would be amazing. Dublin Karst, another one of my creations of cheese. Very open texture to it. 
So this here is a non-pressed cheese. I just use a basket to put this curd in. So how I get to this point is, I, um, we use, uh, well, let me back up. We'll put cultures in, we put our rennet in, we cut the curd, and then when the curd is kind of like a cottage cheese size, we put it into these baskets. And that, of course, are gonna look kind of like the outside of this wheel. But we just let gravity pull the curd in. And then we'll take it out once it's stuck together nice and flip it over so that each side gets a nice texture on it. And then we'll brine this cheese. So brining, we just put it into this tank where there's whey saturated with salt. We let these soak for about 24 hours and then we put a coating on it. It's called Paracoat. It's kind of a wax replacement. It really works a lot better than wax. And um, it adheses to the cheese much better. Where I've tried wax before, but if the wax isn't just perfect, it will leave a little air gap underneath and then molds start and there's just a lot of trouble. And wax is it's really expensive too and it's really miserable to work with. So we love this product. And the Dublin cars, again, it's an open textured, it has some Swiss notes to it, but another excellent, excellent cheese. I, I don't know what I come up with this in 10 years ago, maybe. I think so. And I kind of wanted a, a fast cheese that was young. So I put it in a smaller wheel and it turned out good right from the start. And so I really love this one. I'm gonna let you explain this. I'm gonna give my throat a break a minute, okay? <laughs> I got my daughter here, Chelsea. I'm gonna let her do a little explanation on flavoring on this one, okay? I'm gonna catch a drink. So Chelsea, she does a lot of sales for us, but you've got a great palate and she can explain cheese very well. So <laughs> I'm putting her on the spot here. <laughs> You're allowed to, she's amazing. Hello, Chelsea. Hey. Yeah, so the Dublin cars, really on this one, you get um, a lot of sweetness on this cheese. And we do make this when there is a lot of grass and the cows are on a lot of green grass. So this is uh, a little bit younger. We usually only age this when a few, you know, start three to four months usually. So it's a little younger, but you do get some sweetness and then a little bit of tanginess on the end of this one. It's kind of the predominant, you know, notes you kind of get on this, so. Really, and then this one's also a really good melter as well. And this one makes this is my favorite from Mac and Cheese. If you're ever looking for a really good, yeah, yeah, <laughs> a really good cheese sauce, it makes excellent Mac and Cheese. <laughs> I sure Benjamin, Benjamin. four year old that's uh, attending this class, is going to love that idea. <laughs> yeah. um, and I mentioned somebody did ask if we should eat the paracoat, and I, I said it, it's edible, but right. It's food grade, so it's a food grade glue essentially, but yeah, there's no, there's not good flavor to it. So you don't really want to eat the, the rind of no, them. No benefit. No benefit, no, just kind of rubbery at this point. <laughs> yeah, my uh, Emily said this is, might be the best piece of cheese she's ever had, y'all. Oh. Ah, thank you. <laughs> um, so the, uh, let's see what we got. There was one other question that was, oh, when you refer, oh, Emily, also Emily, when you refer to a cheese as your creation, what does that mean? What goes into creating an entirely new cheese? Well, that's a great question. And I'll tell a little story if I have time about that. When I started to make cheese, it's pretty overwhelming when you go to cheese school and then you come home and the rubber meets the road, you gotta put milk in the vat and make this all happen, right? And then I'd talk to people that said they kind of come up with their own recipe of cheese. And I was just like, how can you do that? That seems so far out, right? And so I remember after, it was probably a couple of years after I was making cheese, I started feeling a lot more comfortable with what I was doing and understanding that different cultures, you'll get different flavor profiles and textures and uh, just with the acidity that you can do with cheese. So I just started understanding milk a lot better. 
And so the first cheese that I created, you know, kind of my own recipe was the Paragon. And I just remember coming across the yard early in the morning, because I'm always an early riser. And I was like, you know, I'm getting a little bored with just making the same cheese as I have been. I need to come up with something new. And so I just, within minutes, I was just kind of like, okay, I can probably do this and this, you know, and, and uh, you know, use this culture and drain it at this time and brine it and, you know, kind of go through my head with different scenarios I could do. And, so I, I made Paragon and it worked the very first time and we still use that cheese today. And I thought, man, how far that I've come as a cheese maker, even in two years, to understand milk enough and the cultures and what acid production does and the rinds and brining and all these different things that you can do to be creative and to come up with a new product. So, so what do I do when I wanna come up with something new? First of all, I have to become a little dissatisfied with what we have and maybe a little bored and get the creative juices flowing and okay, what can we do? So that's what I do. And then I kind of look what's in my arsenal when it comes to cultures and what's going on in my brain. And you have to put science with it, but you have to put creativity with it too. And that's where it gets a lot of fun. So I know that maybe doesn't say, you know, this is exactly how, but with cultures, temperatures, aging, because even in the aging room, this is a good time to talk about that. If I put on a rind with Perico versus a natural rind, that alone can make a real significant difference on a cheese. I could do one with and one without and they're made exactly the same way in the brine or in the tank in the vat. And you'd swear I made two different cheeses. Just because oxygen levels and flavors that they're gonna pick up from the cave are gonna affect the cheese in a different way just by the rind alone. So you, all those things you have to factor in. That's awesome. Well, let's, why don't we show them, I've got some video here, Stuart, of the cheese make process. Okay. I'll throw this on and share the screen. This is an awesome video that y'all put together. And the team put these videos together this week y'all so it's like this is what's happening this week we'll eat this cheese in six months yeah so this is pretty raw footage here and this was just taken so we're draining the the way out right now and we'll get a shot in there in the vat pretty quick so that's the 800 gallon vat we had about close to 500 gallons in there that morning and the whey is draining out. We're actually just irrigating that back on the soil right now. And then they're grabbing the curd. So for example, on the Dublin karst, if I was making karst, I would use different cultures, but I would be packing the karst when the curd is like that right now. So it's kind of like a cottage cheese, but we're making a cheddar. So we're getting all the curd stacked up on the edge. And here's where we start flipping that curd over for the cheddar process to stack. And during this time, we are, um, we keep the curd about a hundred degrees and it'll keep getting more acid. So milk starts out at a 6.8 pH we're gonna get our final product down to a 5.4 before we run it through the mill. And so by flipping this, we're getting a little more whey out of it and we're maintaining heat to get the, uh, uh, keep the acid production. So here's where we're doing the milling. Now we used to have a hand mill, now we have an electric one. It does make life a little easier, but that bad boy will take some fingers off if somebody gets them in there. I, I love that the viewing parlor, you're standing where those folks are in that back window. That's right. So, 
It's amazing that you can watch the cheese make happen. Yeah. So if you come over on cheese making day, you can see this all happen. And uh, so we're milling there. So we're cutting down the curd to smaller pieces, and then we're gonna add salt. So what salt does, of course it's flavoring, but it stabilizes the cheese also so that uh, it stops the acid production. So acid production is very important for cheese. Without it, it just doesn't work. That's why, that's what you use cultures for. It's amazing. And without the salt, it, they're fairly flavorless. Yeah, it is, it's, it's pretty bland. And, um, but yeah, without the salt, the cheese will just keep getting more acid and then it'll sour on you. So you have to use some salt. God, that's always so nice. And uh, then I use a Redmond Real Salt and that has a lot of trace minerals in it. And I really found when I started using that salt that I used about 10% less salt than what I was using. And my cheese actually comes out much, much better. So I'm a real believer in really high quality salt. It costs about five times more than a cheap salt, but it's, I still feel it's worth it because the, um, the cheese just comes out so much better. Beautiful. I've got, I've got oh, while they're packing, I've got yeah. two quick questions. Are y'all still open for visitors at this time? Uh, normally we're not at this hour. So, but if I'm here, I'm always, I sell. Well, I was thinking COVID time, I think is what they're. Oh. <laughs> yes, we are still open. Are you sure you don't stay open until midnight every day? <laughs> I'll leave Chelsea up here for no. that. She'll be feeding the baby anyways. That sounds good. <laughs> And then the other question from one of our beer loving friends is acid production equals lactobacillus question mark. Mm, not necessarily. There are different cultures. I don't use a lot of lactobacillus, but there are cultures. We use a mesophilic starter, sometimes thermophilic starters, but um, it does they do multiply though it, for acid production. They do, the the uh, bacteria do need to multiply in order to get uh, acid production. So yes, on that aspect, definitely. Awesome. All right. Well, so there so they were packing the the curd into the molds, and now they're putting it on the press. And how long will they live there for? They'll stay there for about uh, maybe 18 hours or so. Awesome. And then they'll go from there into the cave. Oh, so we got, I must have added the video twice. Look at that. Yeah. Well, A little more work. Back, yeah. yeah, you can never have too much packing. Well, it? no, actually, I think what they're doing, they're stacking on the press at the same time. It. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, this is just part of the routine. They're stacking on the press as they're filling. So what I think is amazing um, for everybody watching, the question that I'll ask you is, we're getting to see all the action shots. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when the team starts making cheese to when we, you know, the five minutes of action that we actually see here, the draining, the cutting, the milling, how many hours from start to finish does cheese making last? Well, I'll start about 5 a.m. And then they'll be done. This process will last until around maybe 1 o'clock or 1.30 that the curd is actually out of the press. And then they have to clean up the vat and the floors and all the other tools and stuff. So it's, it's a pretty big day. These ladies come in at 8.30 in the morning and they'll probably go home around four. And of course, but I already started the cheese making at 5 a.m. So they're redressing right now. This is called redressing, where they're taking the cheese out of the mold. So it's sat in there for about an hour already and 
they pull out it, they pull it out and flip it over and get it to press from the other direction, the other side, so that it just forms a really beautiful wheel. Yeah, that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. And that's all natural color. The milk is really golden right now. So we're just beautiful cheeses, beautiful flavors, because we've had a lot of rain this year. So we've had really nice grazing. Well, I think it's, it's interesting on the plate that I, we have left. We have two cow's milk cheeses and two sheep's milk cheeses left. Yeah. And the, the depth of the yellow in those cow's, cheese, cow's milk cheeses are incredible. And then the, the sheep's milk are, are that rich ivory color. Yeah. So you can see there's a very big contrast for those of you right. that haven't eaten all your cheese yet. Yeah. So that's awesome. So now we have redneck. Okay. Chat. All right, so I'm going to hack off a piece of redneck here. So redneck cheddar, this was one, I'll tell you a little story how we came up with the name of it. And uh, so I made this cheese, I don't know, a number of years ago again, where we put this, uh, you know, I'll do the, the milling and then um, give the cur the, the curd a bath in this beer. So when I first tried this, and we didn't have it named yet, and I'm here right at the cheese counter with some customers, we opened it up, I'm like, well, it's kind of a beer cheese. And they're like, well, you gotta come up with a name of it. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I said, I kind of have a name, but nobody else really liked it, you know? and. Uh, they said, well, what did you want to call it? I said, well, I wanted to call it Redneck Cheddar. And these people at the counter are like, oh, that is the best name. You got to do that. Well, my wife wanted to name it a little, you know, something more sophisticated, you know, not so redneck, right? And uh, these people were like, oh, you have to do it and do a Redneck Cheddar. So my son was in the office and uh, I said, hey, print up some redneck cheddar labels and it just stuck. And it's really been a great name. It's a catchy name. People just kind of identify, there's jokes about it, you know. Everybody's got a redneck brother-in-law, you know, that they want to give this cheese to. So anyways, that's how the redneck label came about. But I'm gonna let Chelsea talk about this one too, because she can remember the beer that okay. used. <laughs> Well, here you go, Chelsea. Yeah, so right now we're using, um, for all of our redneck, we're using a beer out of Houston uh, from Spindle Trap Brewery, and it's a uh, Russian-style stout to 12% alcohol, so it's a nice, strong beer. Asiete crudo means, roughly translated, uh, crude oil. And so um, we do use, we pour that right on there, and if you kind of look at your piece closely, you can see the marbling in your piece of cheese. And so this uh, redneck is a little bit sharper than what we maybe normally sell it at. Um, it's, a, it's more of a medium sharp for sure. And you do pick up a lot of the maltiness though in the beer on the finish. And so once you're, you know, as you're tasting it, you're really going to get all those malty notes on the end. And so um, we've also done with Antonelli's, we've done how many, we've done three or four, four actual batches. Yeah. We did a batch of couple different batches for ABGB with their beer and um red horn red horn brewery we did it red, was red some red red horn. red something <laughs> yeah red horn and what was the name of the beer uh, spindle tap this is spindle tap brewery and uh spindle tap brewery they're in Houston okay and is their stout yeah Ostiate crudo yep Russian style stout Ostiate and crudo I'll try to spell that Asiete, yeah. A-C, I know, <laughs> sound it out, I don't know. I'll say spindle tap stout. That'll yeah. be close enough and they'll figure it out. Russian yeah, 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 they've got it on their website, so you can definitely check awesome. it out. Awesome, that's awesome. So. Um, well, the cheese tastes amazing on our end. Have you both got tasted your bite oh, yet? Yeah. That's well, amazing, and we're pairing it with a sweet and tangy mustard seed. Ooh. Oh, I bet you that's good. That's really so good. It tastes amazing right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for a while, Jeffries, for those of you in Austin, Jeffries was using this on their cheeseburger for four or five years. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, yeah. 
Tastes there really great. is a maltiness going on. We found with that darker beer, it does give it a little more maltiness to it. So, yeah. And it's quite salty. This is a this pretty is a salty little, This is a little bit of salty, more salty than I would like, but it's still really good. Yeah. Nobody's going to shake their finger at that. That's awesome. Yeah. Gonna, I've got some video here of some more of the make process. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen while you enjoy that bite. Um, this is awesome. And I think this is the brine tank that you yeah. So this is one of, in one of our aging rooms. So this is brine made up of whey, saturated with salt. And uh, we just keep this brine going. We make sure that the acid level is, you know, it's quite acid and then um, keep the salt solution high. And we just soak our wheels of cheese in there like it was so, like you saw there, that's a Gouda in there. And we'll leave them in there, that size wheels we'll leave in there for about 30, 32 hours and it'll absorb salt. And we'll flip them over when they're in there also. So about halfway through, we'll flip them over to the opposite side. All right, awesome. Now let me keep playing, because this is basically the video content is what happens after the wheels are packed and pressed. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so it, like a cheddar would not go into the brine because we salt it in the, in the uh, vat, but like, you know, Dublin Cars, the Greens Creek, Paragon, Texas Star, Goudas, all of them are brine cheeses. So they will go into that brine tank. So there's different ways that you salt. And you know, and then if you get to my blue cheese, we literally dry salt that, where we pat salt on the outside of the wheel. Look so here's in, in one of our aging rooms. I pause yeah. it to give scale. This is incredible. That's like a hero shot right there. <laughs> how, how well, there's a lot of different types of cheese in this room. All the sheep cheeses are in there and all the natural rind cheeses. And then of course there's other ones in there too. A lot of the Gouda is in this room and the Dublin cars. So kind of the, the other room is mostly cheddar, if not all. And this has everything else. It smells amazing in there. It can... really does. We keep it on wood shelves. And um, what's that? Yeah. So we do keep it dark. Of course, we got the lights on now, but we do keep them out, keep the lights off all the time. And you will see if you look close, you can see a little mold growing on some of the cheeses which we like, we inoculated the room with some mold. Beautiful. So yeah, that's just the working cave there. You can really create an amazing atmosphere for aging cheese. It's so important to have the right atmosphere. I'm really convinced of that. I know that, you know, I may be different than a lot of them, Mine is not as whitewashed as maybe some of them you'll see, but I really find with the molds and stuff uh, in the cave, it really creates a lot of amazing flavors in a good way. I, I find molds very beneficial. I'd say if there's something that I really want to learn more about is molds. I've been at a cheese class already where this one lady, it was crazy. She could tell you everything about every mold and what they do and their flavor profiles. And it's like, oh my gosh, it blows you away. She must have a PhD in molds, you know? So was, was this the batch of Greens Creek that you opened at the beginning? Yeah, exactly. You see how it's kind of poofed up just a little bit there? Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing because it would would have stayed it started in the same format as say one of the, any of the other cheeses that you showed us uh, uh, in this video. But you see how guys had rounded off a bit more. Yeah, that's a good that that 
is what gave Stuart the understanding of what bacteria was ex existed in there. If you hit this thing, you know, it doesn't have a nice firm slap to it. I don't know if that's coming over it or not. Yes. But it's just a dead thud, you know? If you get a good cheese, they get a nice firm slap to them, like this one here. It's yep. just amazing. That's and amazing. So when you get that thud, you know you got some nice eye formation going on. But yeah, you picked it out right there. That's cool. What a good, what an amazing place. How, how long ago, oh, I've got a question here. Does, does the wood matter for this shelf? Does the type of wood matter? You know, I think it, it might. Um, and I probably, I would say it definitely does. I am not an expert on the wood. We're pretty limited with what we can use here or what we can find, I think. I do have, I just bought this, it's a pine wood and just right from my local yard and it seems to work real good. But on my other cave, I did um, get some of that wood from the Netherlands and I bought that in, I think 2000, the fall of 2000 or 2001, I believe it was, 2001, at the very beginning of my cheese making. And um, the lady, I bought it through uh, Margaret Morris, you know, out of Glenwood, Glengarry Cheese Making. Sure. And she said, now I didn't wash these and sterilize them like I was maybe supposed to, but she says, you're gonna get some good molds all the way from Holland. I'm like, oh, I love you. <laughs> and you didn't have to pay extra. No. <laughs> awesome. Well, I got some old boards. She said some of them boards are probably a hundred years old, and I got them in my cave. That's amazing. So yeah. and here, here's you can see all of the goodness. This is all goodness at the, yeah. the, the bottom. And so what is it, what is he rubbing on here now? Is this olive oil? That's olive oil. So the fat tail tongue, which we'll try in just a couple minutes, I suppose. Um, this is an olive oil rub brine. So it's Manchego style. And this is exactly how they do the rind. They just pour the olive oil on and give the cheese a massage in olive oil. And okay. as you'll taste in a minute, that fruitiness of the olive oil really comes through on that cheese. So, um, yeah. yeah, it just gets well, a nice massage. Is, that's my son-in-law that's rubbing the cheese there. So he's the manager of the cave. So he works probably 40, 45 hours out there every week. It's full time. It's amazing. Just taking, just babysitting cheese. And this is the natural rind like on a Texas star and a Green Street. Yeah, so here's, here's the natural rind where he's washing the uh, Greens Creek or this is a Texas star and um, we do the Goudas for a little bit that way too. We'll wash the Gouda cheese for about a week to 10 days and then put a pair of coat on. That's awesome. All right. Coming to the end of this one. All right, that's amazing. Any questions? Well, I think everybody is getting into those, that moment of the class where they're just smiling ear to ear because the cheese tastes so good. So no questions yet. But um, so we I saw that Rachel has joined us, which is exciting. Uh, that's oh, good. Great. We do have the caraway cheddar to taste uh, before we move over to the sheep milk. Okay. All right, is everybody ready for caraway cheddar? Oh yeah. All right. So all these little seeds in here, we just actually take the caraway and mix it right into the curd. And so you can tell the history of that one since this has a little to do with our Dutch roots. Veldheisen is a Dutch name. Yeah. So caraway, when I started making cheese, I wasn't gonna do much for flavors, but my mother come out to the cheese making room and she says, you know, I really want you to put some caraway into a cheese. Cause she says, I always love caraway and cheese. And I was like, oh, 
problem. You know, okay, mom. Mom asks, you better do, right? So You're I made a few you. wheels of cheese with caraway in, and it turned out really beautiful. And uh, so that's how it is. It's really my mother's fault that we started making mm -hmm. caraway. <laughs> But because of the Dutch heritage, that's why we got it, you know? How many times did she have to ask you before you did it? Oh, just one time. We just did it once. She come oh, out, amazing. I'm like, yeah, we will do that. So she yeah. brought me the caraway seed. How could I say no? That's amazing. Well, that's yeah. a, it's incredible. I wonder how many times Benjamin, that four-year-old, uh, takes for him to say yes to do something. Probably a lot. A lot more than one. So I really like this. Now, this is what's interesting I find with caraway. I love it. And it goes great with a bold red wine, a good Merlot or Malbec, something that's heavy red. It's beautiful, I think, with that. Caraway, I always say this, because we get a lot of people tasting our cheese. You either love it or you don't. Okay, so if you don't like caraway, I get it, not everybody does. It's not, usually, you don't find many people that say, well, it's okay. They either like, yes, it's great, or I really don't wanna taste that. So, <laughs> so that's kind of the way it is with caraway. Well, I love it. I was, I'm just thinking this is a great way to have a Reuben gluten-free. Just oh, two, two wedges of this cheese, the pastrami and the Reuben. We had a, there was a restaurant, they're not going right now, but that in Stephenville, but used it as, they called it the Veldheisen Reuben. And uh, used the caraway cheddar on that Reuben and it was fabulous. Awesome. Those are number one selling cheese. That's amazing. Great. And they charged the most for it and they sold the most sandwiches of it. That's amazing. I yeah. really, well, when they open, we can all come up on a bus. And eat yeah. Them. Um, I got a question here that are the caraways toasted or not? We actually boil them and I have to bring them up to a boil. So we use a minimal amount of water so that I don't pour away flavor. But I do have to bring them up to a boil and then put them into the curd because if I don't boil it, then I get mold uh, going on around the uh, seeds. So yes, okay. not toasted, but they are boiled with minimal amount of water. All right. Well, I've, I've, I've got, while we're all chewing and enjoying, I've got video of the, the K, uh, blue K, well, I'll show you what the video is. Let's see if I got it right. Yeah. No, I'm playing the wrong video, I think. This is what we just did. So I've got the wrong one there. Give me a second, y'all. Uh, well, I got the wrong video. It looks like, wait, wait a second. I met, I got the wrong video here. It's in the same yeah. room. No, I know. I, this is not good. I clicked the wrong room. Room. You just have to, um, here we go. Here we go. I've got it now, y'all. Takes me a second, but I, oh no, wait a second. <laughs> What am I doing here? I'm making sure I, I spliced a lot of these together yesterday and I'm, I'm not sure that I didn't oh, make a mistake. Now, do you have Rachel out there in the barn on milking? Yeah. You might want to show her before she's done. All right, well, let's do that. I'll jump over there. Yeah, uh, we can always come back, but milking right. can't wait. Yeah, let's do that. All right, Ra Rachel, can you hear me? Yes. Can you All hear right. me? I'm, yes. And I'm going to spotlight your video. There you are. Awesome. <laughs> hey. So we finished milking already. I That's wasn't sure if it would work very well because the milkers are so loud with the vacuum pump. That's the so, with that. So we did finish milking. <laughs> so, well, do you want to, uh, where are you standing out right now? Oh, we're, we're still in the barn. We got to do all the washing up now. Okay. So we just finished milking, me and my kids. Amazing. 
Thank you for all the work. This is Elisha. Elisha's 10. And this is Wilberforce. How are you? 11. <laughs> and we have Gilbert. Hey, y'all. He's 13. Well, thank you for helping get this amazing, um, amazing food on our plates. You're feeding a lot of people. Thanks for all this hard work. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Well, Rachel, do you I want to tell us about your passion project? About yeah, well, we, uh, we got the sheep. We started with just uh, 10 sheep five years ago. And now we have quite a few sheep, over 100. <laughs> But um, we're milking 50 sheep this year. And so we got lots of lambs running around. I don't know, maybe you can see them a little bit there in the background, a few of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And we, we have some film of it, too. Why don't I, do you mind if I play that while we, uh, that will give you some? Yeah, that would work video you all made over the last couple days. And I'll share. Sure. Here we go. Here are the babies. And what's amazing is, as as far as I know, y'all are the only sheep dairy in, uh, making cheese in Texas. And that's an amazing feat. It's not easy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something that is pretty new in this area. There's not many in the whole United States. Um, probably only between 50 and 100 sheep dairies in the United States. Yeah. So when did you decide that you were, like sheep was something that you were attracted to and, and going down this path? Well, I think it's just something that I decided would be a good addition to the dairy here. So my family and I lived in Africa for several years. And then when we came back to Texas here, we came to the farm and wanted to join in the farm again and so decided to get some sheep just as something that we could add on to what we're already doing here to have another new product and something different so we got a few sheep and just started seeing how it would work we made a you know we made like one wheel of cheese at a time that first year and just experimenting with different things and we we're able to make something that was really nice and unique and so we grew it from there well it's amazing and we're, we're are we in the same milking parlor with this view that the cows were in on the other side yes we sure are Hey. First, the, the cows are milked first, and then after the cows are milked, then the sheep go in and they're milked. <laughs> That's amazing. So you have to retrofit everything, I imagine, then. Well, we we had to add it in. So we just we wanted to make it so that we use the same pipeline. We have different milkers for the sheep, of course, because sheep only have two teats and cows have four. So just so that you all know that now. <laughs> be so, end. so we added, we just added the sheep milkers and kind of made it all work. And there's different pulsation for the sheep. Yep. Um, so are they uh, the animals on two different sides of the property or do they mingle? They they do graze some of the same fields, but we do have a, and some areas that just the sheep go in or just the cattle, mainly because of the fencing. Um, 
not, you know, some of the fences here will hold cows, but not sheep. And so we have to have some fields that will hold the sheep. <laughs> so that's when when that's you were, how it goes. when you were starting the herd, um, did you choose a specific species to start with, or did you uh, um, adopt some la uh, lambs, some ewes? How, how did you begin that? Heard. Well, the first, uh, <laughs> that was lamb 2020. We'll forgive her for that. She's a sweet lamb. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I need to go back and do a replay. <laughs> what did that baby do? Oh, yeah. She was the 20th lamb that was born this year. Oh, and she ended up being a bottle baby. Because her mama got real sick. Okay. But so we had to feed her bottles, but she's grown well and doing great. So. Um, so yeah. So yeah. So the first sheep we got were a wasi, and they are a fat tail sheep from the Middle East. We got them because they do well in hot weather and are very adaptable to different climates. So we got those. Um, but they're quite new in this country and very expensive. And so we didn't, we couldn't buy more, you know, we couldn't really buy enough of them, but we got a few of them. And then we got East Frisian and Lacone sheep. Um, so we got, we got, so the next year after we got the Oasis, we got 50 East Frisian sheep, which are the main uh, are the main dairy sheep in this country. And then we got Lacone rams to put over them. So a lot of our herd is getting more Lacone now. Lacones are the sheep that are, they come from France. Their milk is used to make the Roquefort blue cheese in France. So good, so creamy. They're beautiful. Yes. I just typed into the chat window that this was a uh, sheep milk Gouda that you made yesterday, right? That one was actually a mixed milk Gouda. Oh, and so okay. it's, it's part sheep milk and part cow's milk. Okay. And the milk is very creamy at this time of the year. Um, it's so hot right now. The animals give less milk, but the milk that they give is much more creamy. So uh, while we're while we're watching the f them finish making, um, do you want to talk about fat tail tome? And uh, you know what you what you were inspired to make a cheese like this? Yeah, well the fat tail tome is it's uh, you know it's based on the Manchego recipe, but it's different because it is a tom. And so I wanted to make a nice natural rind cheese. And so we tried, you know, tried doing some different rinds and um, just really liked the olive oil rubbed on the rind. It imparts just a slightly different flavor, a little more fruitiness and just you know very distinct but very delicate flavors uh other than just a regular washed rind so it grows some nice molds and it's just you know you can eat the rind and so i really i really like how it turned out I, how it looks and and the flavors that come out with that it's one of our shops favorite. It's wonderful. And the wheel's tasting spectacular tonight. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> um, we also have your sheep cheddar here on the plate too. Um, I know those, those kiddos probably want to go and pl uh, play and hang out um, with you instead of hanging out with us tonight. So we won't take much more of your time, but we are so grateful for all four of you and the rest of the whole family that's involved in making these cheeses for us. It's, they're incredible. So incredible. Yeah. 
Well, thanks. It's been fun. It's really neat that you're doing this because yeah, you got to see a lot of places that we don't even take people when they come here. So that's cool. Yeah, I, and that it's amazing actually. I I'm, I just can't believe that we're getting to see this video. It's just so cool. <laughs> I haven't been able to make it up since you've made started making the sheep milk cheeses, and so that was just so. What what should the folks expect from the sheep cheddar? And then y'all go and have a re wonderful rest of your evening. Well, for the sheep milk cheddar, it's um, it's a cheddar cheese, so. It has the texture of a cheddar cheese, which is a firmer texture, saltier flavor. Uh, it has more of a, just a sweet, clean, nutty taste. And so it's just a, a twist on, you know, a cow's milk cheddar. So you'll just notice different flavors. It's so vibrant tonight. It's tasting amazing. <laughs> oh goodness well thank you so much and um, i'm grateful for you being a part of this and uh, for sharing your passion with us and i'm sure everybody else here on the call feels the same way uh, that was awesome Rachel. and uh I'm, my belly is super happy and so what y'all y'all can feel free to stay on if you want but otherwise thank you again thanks for being a part of this and, um, I'm, I, we're just so very grateful for your time. Uh, I haven't night. finished work yet. <laughs> yes, we've got some work to do yet, but thank y'all. It's been fun. Have a good one. All right. Bye. That was awesome, Stuart. That was so cool. That is a powerhouse. Right. You can reach that well out there from the barn. <laughs> well, that's a powerhouse family. That's amazing what they're doing out there. So. And the you cheese. Know, it's so cool just to see the uh, kids involved in every day of life. They're out there early in the morning, and all the kids are out there working. They go help mom in the evening, and then they all go to the house for dinner together. So it builds a lot of character. It really does. Um, so. Yeah. Well, they're amazing. So I did. I did get to uh, solve the technical issue. It's just that John was doing too many things at once, eating cheese <laughs> and trying to walk at the same time. And sometimes that doesn't work. And so I got the video um, for you here. It's got, uh, it's the other side of the cave. Okay. I believe. I think, <laughs> I think I got it right. Underground one. Well, let's see. I think I got it right. We're about to find out because it's starting a similar way. No, nope, there we go. We went in a different door this time. Yeah, this is the one, this is the first one that I built. This is an underground one. So there's a natural hill. And this is where I started with my, you know, aging cheese. And, you know, just from the stuff, I was not a cheese snob at all. I didn't know that much about it. So I had to literally learn everything about cheese. I didn't hardly, I didn't start eating cheese until I was in my mid twenties. So. Um, so we built this in a natural hill there and we still have to air condition it, you know, refrigerate it a little bit, but it does really give a good flavor profile. And you can see some of the shells in there. There's different wood in there, but I have some in there from the Netherlands. You'll see some of the old ones in there, maybe right there is one. That's an old, old board right from the Netherlands. And, um, but yeah, I think of the coolest story that I had about that cave, as far as really assuring me as a young cheese maker that I was on the right track. So I went to the American Cheese Society a couple of years after we were making cheese and sat down with a bunch of cheese makers and they got to my cheese. And you know, when you're a newbie cheese maker, it's very intimidating having experienced people taste your cheese, but you got to do it so that you get opinions, right? And uh, they tasted my cheese, a couple of these brothers. I wish I knew who they were today, but I don't think I'll ever remember. And uh, they said, do you have a cave? And I'm like, yeah. 
And they're like, we can taste it, man. We are building a cave when we get back to Wisconsin. They were so sold on the cave atmosphere. So I think all of these things, I mean, I know they all have an influence and an impact on the final product. So I'm really happy that I did it. It was a lot of work building it. All these buildings that you've seen, except the milking parlor, of course, we had to make some changes in it. But all the buildings that you were in, we literally built with our family. And even the one I'm standing in tonight. And um, we didn't have a lot of funds to get this farm going, but we had a lot more time. And we had, uh, you know, time to build it, which we probably don't anymore. But so we had to build everything, kind of do it the hard way, but it was a good way. We learned a lot and we saved a lot of money instead of hiring contractors. And, and I think that's why we're here today. So it's, uh, it's a great story and, and it's kind of fun to see it keep going and improving and changing and evolving to what we are today. And I don't know what it'll be like in five years. But. So here we are back in the first one that you were in and this is the blue cheese. So blue cheese is wrapped in this foil wrap. It's kind of like a heavy duty gum wrapper. So it's paper on the in inside and the foil on the out. And so when I say, you know, just by salting makes a difference with my blue cheese, I found that um, I dry salt at first and I used a white mold paper on the outside and I was just having too much mite trouble with it. So then I switched to brining and my cheese changed too much. It was still okay, but it wasn't really great. And the chefs weren't quite as happy with it. So after about, I don't know, seven, eight months, I switched back to dry salting. Now, when I say dry salt, we literally pat salt on the outside of the cheese and then wrap it in this foil wrap. And I changed to the foil wrap. And so when I went back to that, then the Bosque Blue just became phenomenal again. So little things make Amazing. big differences. It's beautiful. And I, I just let everybody know that the material that uh, your son-in-law was rubbing on the out paint painting on the outside, yeah. that was the paracoat, the orange, the orange rind that we peeled off. Yes. Does, yeah. does it go on in layers? Yeah, we put three layers on. Three layers, cool, yeah. it's beautiful. And then I've got our last video, I've eaten all my cheese, there's no more cheese oh, left. But you know what, we missed something. If, if everybody ate their fat-tailed Tom already, I don't know what you're pairing it with, but I'm gonna show you what I pair it with. All right. I I, enjoy, I inhaled mine. What do you got? Is that chocolate? Chocolate cake. Oh, zucchini. yes, please. It's zucchini <laughs> cake with almond flour, because I don't do gluten. Piled high with fat-tailed Tom. Uh-uh-uh. You, I can't believe that you didn't give the rest of them the memo. Is this on the, is this on the actual tour? <laughs> <laughs> We'll be there tomorrow. Shoot. <laughs> I just had to. I had to do that. Go you know, look at this, you guys. It's amazing. Cheese with chocolate cake. Uh, uh, uh. I, can, I can believe it. That's amazing looking. Well, you, you make all of us jealous because I got no more food left. <laughs> it's dessert. Perfect. Mm. It's awesome. I love it. That makes me happy. <laughs> well, I've got, we've got this short video of the shop, the inside of the shop, which you, most everybody's seeing, but I might as well share it. Yeah. Um, and because uh, it's uh, super cool. This is guys what you, when you come in along the driveway, uh, you're coming along and you're, the caves are on the right hand side. Uh, so you see those beautiful doors and then, but straight ahead, is is the shop it's you know it's kind of what's calling you to enter and so here's yeah. it's amazing and this is only what 12 minutes from 281 uh yeah 
That's about right. Yeah, it's amazing. So that's what we're standing in tonight. And our family built that too. We actually had, this was kind of a neat story. We actually had a barn raising day and I had a lot of friends that came out and uh, on a Saturday and we put up all the walls in one Saturday. And then my family put the roof on, the rafters on the roof and finished the roofing that following week. But in one day we had uh, 36 people working on the building at one time, putting this thing up. So I noticed grateful to all them people that helped. I noticed the Dutch Stroop waffles by the register. Is that was that a, is that somebody's <laughs> personal addiction? A few Dutch items because again, you got you know got to stick to the Dutch roots. And there's actually a number of Dutch people in our area. There's a lot of Dutch dairy in here, so we carry slack licorice, and Stroop waffles, and cheese scuff, and things like that. So. That's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Well, this was absolutely incredible. Um, I don't see any more. Oh, the only last question that we have is, can you mail that cake? I'm not sure. That <laughs> that... <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Hey, I got a few pieces left in the pan. How far are you? Nice. <laughs> they can be up there in an hour. No, I, All this... right. <laughs> Bring All a right. bottle of wine. Let's go. Uh, I am so very grateful for having this opportunity to spend with you tonight. Um, wow. That was awesome, first off. That was an incredible tour. Uh, I feel like I'm there with you right now. And, and uh, one of the things that I so admire about you and your family is that every time I talk to you, I end up laughing, which is a really amazing thing. You know, there's... <laughs> I feel good. I, I'm, I'm smiling. It could be that, that the cheese tastes so good, but it's also because you are such good people. Um, thank thank you. you for sharing your passion and everything. And um, uh, is there anything else you want to share before we... Uh... Well, we, you know, you're, anybody is invited to come to the farm and experience it. Take a little time to go look around and hang out. You know, we got a nice pond down there where there's some wild ducks and they're not really afraid of people too much. If you get too close, yes. But take a look around and just enjoy the experience and the aromas in the cave and taste lots and lots of cheese and hang out. So it's not that long of a trip. So we'd love to have you come out. I think you'll definitely enjoy it. Thank you so much, John, for what you did. and All the people that logged on tonight, Appreciate everybody who's supporting us and um, helping us keep the farm going. And really, honestly, it's pretty tough times for us right now. We're going to be okay. It's not that we're going to go under or anything like that. But with all the forced foreclosures on restaurants, it was the largest part of our sales. And, you know, basic economics is if you don't sell something, it's hard to keep life going. So... But we appreciate what everybody's doing, and uh, we're going to make it. And But we do love it when people come out and experience it and have a great time. So we love to have fun when people come out. Well, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Y'all are uh, amazing people, and I am so very grateful to have gotten to do this with you. Um, Thanks for doing, John. So as one of our traditions, which I don't know that anybody else does this, but I'm going to, I like to unmute everybody so that they can say thank you too, because this is a labor of love down to every single bite. And so I'm unmuting everybody. If you'd like to say thank you, just unmute yourself and let the cacophony begin. I love you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Tell your mom that you have good stuff. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. The blue. It was good the whole time. Oh, that's beautiful. That's what life's about right there. Isn't that wonderful? That was awesome. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful.
You know, there's a lot of great people across the state. I've been there, we missed the blue. And other states too, mm -hmm. across America. We have amazing people. I don't know. Take oh, care and stay yep. safe. Thank Bye. You. Oh, down there at the bottom. That one. Well, yeah. thanks so much, y'all. All right, John. Have an awesome night. Thank you. You guys make me so happy.